you know, sometimes you just got to go for it and, and just have that faith that, you know, you're going to work hard and just try your best. I've been wanting to have today's guest on the show for years, and we finally made it happen. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contraband Conversations, and we are speaking today with Linda May Han Oh, who is one of my favorite bassists on the planet and just such an endlessly fascinating artist. I had such a great time with this conversation, folks. We talk about her latest album, which just won the Best New Work Jazz Award from Art Music Awards, and it's the latest in a series of super cool projects. She recently relocated to Perth, Australia, where she's originally from, so we talk about that, and she's teaching full-time for the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, so that's an interesting time (laughs) difference. So we dig into the album, other projects, the pandemic in general, her unique biofolio physical medium that she used for the latest album and so many other things composing it's just very cool check out the links to her website the album and social media and all that good stuff in the show notes and a quick shout out to our sponsors ear trumpet labs practisma and modacity you'll hear more from them later but let's get into this conversation with linda may han oh So were you planning on coming back to Perth anyway for a bit with, uh, I know, I know having a family around, uh, it can be great when you have a, have a young one. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really the intention because basically we still had a bunch of tours left to do in March and all throughout the summer. And I teach at at Berkeley college of music, um, in the bass department. So, um, we weren't planning on, on coming to Perth. And the funny thing was, right when the sort of global COVID shutdown happened, I was just finishing, I was on tour with Pat Metheny, and we just finished dates in Australia and New Zealand. So I'd just come home to visit oh, and, no. and see my friends and family. <laughs> and we flew to Argentina, I got stuck there for a few days, and then ended up in um, back home in New York. And at that point, um, Yeah, we stayed there kind of during um, quite a high period of the kind of COVID, you know, graph, you know, and um, and then I found out I was pregnant and we just thought it was the best decision um, to come back and be with family for this time. Yeah. um, Considering that the tours were no longer happening. Yeah. 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 I live in San Francisco. And so I was sort of watching everything occur in New York, you know, to a to more severe extent, you know, a few weeks after we got locked down here. And I knew you were in New York because I was watching those uh, discoverable bass videos that you were a part of. And and so, um, you know, I was in Australia for the first time this fall. There was a Melbourne bass day uh, the, hosted by Rob Nair. And I'm not sure if you if you know Rob in any capacity. Mm, no, I'm not familiar with Rob now. One of these days, I'm, I'm sure you'll meet. He is from Australia. He moved back to Adelaide and has been teaching at the University of Melbourne. But he taught for years and years at Penn State and also taught early music at Juilliard. And and, and so we were talking a lot about the flight. And, you know, my first trip to Australia, that 17 hour flight of death from California to and and and, and I know it's even magnified from New York because it's like, you know, it's, it's that's quite a that's quite a quite a feat uh, getting to and from. Yeah, yeah. It's it's literally pretty much the, the furthest you could get from New York City. If you drilled a hole, you'd get pretty, <laughs> you know, pretty much Western Australia right there. And, and we flew through Dubai because that was the kind of the only way to do it, to not have to quarantine twice in Sydney and and um, Perth. Yeah, so. Okay. Well, because I know when people come from Europe to to Australia, that's a, a rough flight too. And don't they don't you typically transfer in Dubai or some somewhere else in the Middle East? Is that that's kind of common, right? Yeah, it is quite common. I've I've done the from Europe to to Australia, going through Dusseldorf or, or Frankfurt. Mm. You know, uh, I think yeah, Frankfurt is is kind of the main hub. Um, yeah, um, yeah. But the the du- Dubai one is actually I actually don't mind it so much. It's two flights as opposed to three going through LA and Sydney. So um, 
Yeah, it, it can be better, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Rob Nairn was telling me you have to think of it, of it in terms of movies. Don't think of 17 hours. Think of it's mm. just like six six movies or seven movies or whatever it is. And I, I tried to think about that. Um, but boy, you know, uh, Rob, after making the move to Adelaide just to get back to home and, and just have family around, uh, Juilliard was sort of expecting him to come back every month and teach. I think they just assumed, and Rob said... No, siri, I am not doing that because the the wear and tear on, on just your your life. I mean, even and California is easier than than New York or from Europe, obviously. But but boy, that's not that's no fooling around. The length of flight and travel, and then the jet lag and all that, and the chaos of the Dateline. It's a uh, it's a uh, serious business. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. It it is a lot to travel. It, you know, on on the one hand, it's like. Um, our lives are so busy that it's kind of nice the thought of just like being disconnected and not not having to answer emails not having to you know take care of things in some ways and i'm i'm lucky i'm not super tall so i don't have to cram into i I really have much respect for musicians and and travelers who are very tall because I don't know if I, I could handle it then, but you know, so th- there is like some part of it. It's it's nice to kind of um, catch up on movies and, and that sort of thing. That's usually the time when I do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, me too. I've always resisted the urge to sign up for the Wi-Fi or anything on the flight just because I, I've learned, like you're saying, to to appreciate that break from the, the, the pace of activities and the constant pings and messages and answering emails and the like. Uh, well, how is uh, was I, you know I, I was in Australia in November, which is just when fire that those horrible bushfires were picking up. Um, d- did that? I, I, would did that affect Perth to the same extent as as Sydney, Melbourne, and that area? Were, were things raging out of control over there too? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't as bad um, for sure on, on the on the west. Yeah, it was it was the east that was affected, and we kind of flew through some of it. Um, as we flew through Sydney and it was quite hazy and um, it got progressively worse um, from what I gather. My sister lives in Sydney and um, yeah, it was difficult for them, you know, to see everything covered in haze and just the the air quality of, you know, her and her family. So um, I think uh, Western Australia is quite lucky, you know, in that sense. Yeah, it wasn't so impacted, but yeah, it's devastating. A lot of the wildlife, a lot of those small businesses in the rural areas. So yeah, and, and the nature, it's, it's kind of irreparable. There's a rosin maker yeah, outside of Sydney named Andrew Baker. He makes leatherwood bespoke rosin. I'm not sure if you're familiar no, with it. No. Oh, no. okay. I'll, I, I'll, I'd be more than happy to introduce you if you want to check out some really groovy rosin. It's extremely yeah. cool. He has five different hydration levels. And so, so which, is, which is great if you're traveling. You know, and the, the dry stuff is actually, it, it still has that tackiness that base rosin has. Um, um, and then the, the most hydrated, I wouldn't touch with my bow. It'll turn it to a sheet of glass. Um, but anyway, I brought that up because Andrew, we, I was talking with him about the fires. He's on a farm outside of Sydney, and it was it, his his property survived. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was that was scary to watch. And, and visiting, I only went to Sydney and Melbourne, and I, I realized how badly I need to get back and do a more proper exploration. What a what an amazing country! Um, and then I look on the map and I think Perth. Perth is you know it's it that's like flying from New York to L.A. Isn't it in terms of Sydney to Perth? Well, what 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 is Perth like? It's a couple million people, right? It's it, I've looked at photos and it looks uh, it looks in some ways like Melbourne. What's it like there? Yeah, um, so it's it's still a major city, um, though um, I'm not sure if, if if it's still the most isolated major city um, in the world. It used to be, um, but yeah, it, it's still quite metropolitan. Um, um, Generally, the planning, the urban planning is a bit more spread out. Um, we're right on the coast, so I'm very lucky to have beautiful beaches um, and and great national parks. You know, um, in this area, we have a park nearby, Yelagonga National Park, where we can just, uh, it's a very quick drive and you can see some beautiful kangaroos and, you know, um, it's yeah, it's just great. You know, so there's some great nature intermixed with, with the actual city and, you um, yeah, there's a great scene of, of arts and um, and music and dance and um, actually, you know, mentioning those awards, the art awards, um, 
that happened recently um, there were quite a few recipients from from the western australia perth area so so there's a lot happening um it's just very far away you know and i think when people are usually planning their tours it's it's kind of easy to plan the kind of melbourne sydney um you know brisbane um and new zealand kind of thing and but to to come across to perth is a big commitment for sure um but yeah and western australia is huge and there's so many beautiful um regions here to travel and to see um there's broom up north on the northwest tip and the kimberley region which is to me it's unreal there's no other um, place on the planet like it and and down south there's some beautiful beaches down there mm -hmm. I have I have to get there and explore. It looks like such a such a fantastic place. And R Rob Niren was telling me all about. You know, I, I just realized. I mean, it, I didn't have enough time. I didn't have time to extend that trip. I was only there maybe two weeks. Uh, but I should have gotten out and and done more. But what I, what struck me visiting because I you know didn't know much about Australia except some lovely people I've met from there. The the musical scene in Melbourne and Sydney, but jazz, classical. I'm Class, classical is my background, but I was spending some time with some jazz players. It seems like a thriving scene, at least in those two cities. I, uh, a, a bassist in the Melbourne Symphony named Ben Hanlon does a lot of work as a jazz player, too. And he was just rattling off these clubs and all these, uh, you know, that at least eight months ago were vibrant. And I was just thinking, wow, that's like, you know, the, the 10 times the activity that's happening here in San Francisco. It, it is dispersed have or now or did it have when you were growing up a pretty vibrant art scene or jazz scene or um to me to me it was is pretty vibrant i mean in, in the sense that um that was kind of what instigated me to get more into the music was the local musicians and some of the local clubs we didn't have a lot of them but um but there was a a strong following for certain bands and certain venues you know and um and uh you know, some of these bands were kind of, um, uh, they kind of range from from some experimental to some more traditional or, or maybe modern contemporary jazz to, to more fusion, you know, and, um, you know, um, I think that stems also from the conservatory that is there, the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts, WAPA, um, which is also a great acting and dance conservatory. And a lot of great people came out of there. Um, and just, just to name a few, Dane Alderson, who plays with the Yellow Jackets at the moment, um, he was kind of up and coming when I was still in high school and, and I would look at him. And he's not much older than me, but he was um, he was just ridiculous at that point, you know. Um, and Troy Roberts, great tenor player who plays with Jeff Tane Watts. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of very talented people from, from Perth as well that kind of contribute to that that um vivacity and i think you know in some ways it's like there's there's not a whole lot to do besides it's kind of like the the beach nature and practicing and shedding with your friends so it's like then then that kind of leads to to gigs and and a following for for certain bands yeah this episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contrabass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. People have been saying such great things about my course with Discover Double Bass Beginners Classical Bass. Here is Nicholas Walker, professor of double bass at Ithaca College and past president of the International Society of Basses. Nicholas writes, Jason draws from this vast network with his contagious enthusiasm and love of learning. Presented through the beautifully organized and easily accessible framework of Discover Double Bass, this is a terrific learning experience for any beginner as well as a great model for any new teacher. I am blushing, Nicholas. Thank you so much. 
I'm just so thrilled with how this course came out. Jeff Chalmers and the whole team at Discover Double Bass are so professional. It was such a great experience, and it was the best representation of what I would love to take every single beginner through in terms of format and presentation. And I'm just I'm just so happy that it's out there. You can learn more. We've got a link in the show notes, or you can just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. That sounds like an inspiring setting to have like that. It, it, wow. It's a, now, I think I've got your a musical instrument trajectory right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but started on piano when you were young, doing the Yamaha method, which is that that's kind of like the Suzuki method, right? Some similarities? Mm, I think so. I mean, I'm not I'm not super familiar with the Suzuki method, but, but what I went through was just um, kind of exploring music um, in a fundamental way of how we respond to music and, and emotions and colors. And I remember quite clearly just, um, you know, being asked to listen, you know, what, what does this make you feel like? What do you see? What colors do you see? And, um, and even to the point of memorizing pictures and pictures with, with color or feelings. And um, my older sister, um, she, she memorizes pictures, but she sees, uh, we see pictures quite differently. So I'll see like, E for me is a bit more greeny, F is a bit more bluey, purpley, and for her it's it's more like uh, figures, like I, I can't remember the exact um, code for her, but it's like um, F is like a maternal figure and A is like a young um, boy or something, so it's, it's kind of interesting, like, um, you know, associating pictures or, um, you know, music or even textures with color and, um, and, and personas you know so um that's what we kind of learned initially like through yamaha and um, just a lot of oral work you know which set a good foundation for for the rest of our kind of musical uh, language that's interesting that's it. Were, were your parents musicians in any capacity or just just got you started early okay okay that's cool. yeah and my mom was kind of vicariously living through us because she never had the chance to learn piano so she for her it was fun to kind of to sit and, and play with us and 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 watch us, you know, practice that sort of thing. Wow. Yeah. Mm. wow. Now, I, and, uh, and again, correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but I think clarinet, you started playing clarinet at some point, right? Uh, yeah, just um, in public school, like, you know, as 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 many students do. Um, um, yeah, I think around like eight or nine or something like okay. that. Yeah. Okay, like playing mm. in band in school? And that yeah. kind of thing. And mm-hmm. then they probably yeah. needed a bassoon player and you start playing bassoon. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> I, know clarinet, I know clarinet to bassoon is one of the, that or flute to bassoon can work too, just mm. in terms of the fingerings or that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah when, exactly. When's the last time you played clarinet or bassoon? Did you, is that, mm. is, are those ancient memories or do you have like a secret bassoon mm. practicing room in your place? Or? Uh, yeah, I wish, I really wish. Uh, it's been a long time since I played clarinet. I, we actually have one here. Um, uh, but bassoon, um, yeah, I still have one in New York and there was a time when I was like, okay, I'm going to be diligent and I'm going to play a little bit each day. Um, and I, I did play it on, on a record, um, a little, quite a while ago now, 2011, um, initial here. Um, and I kind of tracked a few layers of, of bassoon. Um, but I, you know, it's, I really wish it was something I could kind of keep up. There's just a lot to do. And I think the last time I kind of played it semi publicly was when I did a, a duet, um, with my, um, with my friend, Ben Wendell, who plays tenor saxophone and he also plays bassoon. So, um, we thought it'd be funny to have some outtakes where I would play bassoon and he would play, I fall in love too easily on bass, you know, so that's up on YouTube somewhere. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, you, I've, got, yeah. I've got some sleuthing to do after we chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only like a small snippet, but yeah, it, I love bassoon. I really do. It's such a beautiful instrument and um, yeah, if I if I had more time, I'd love to keep it keep it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I I taught high school orchestra for about seven years mm-hmm. and had to take every instrument. And I remember how much I just sort of enjoyed the feeling of the b- vibration of the bassoon reed. Mm-hmm. It really connected with my bass player. What what baffled me on bassoon were the fingerings. I realized yes. like mm-hmm. how, how great the flute saxophone sort of innovations were. So I I I, I liked the sounds I could make. Getting to new notes was uh, the major issue. But I felt I felt a similar feeling with French horn. I, I, I mm. you know, but but just that timbre and that sort of vibration is really uh, mm. really cool. And then it was electric yeah. bass. You start high school, right? Is that you? You just want yeah. to try some other things, or 
Yeah, I um I had a garage band with with some friends, and um, I also played in the jazz band um, at that time at at in high school, and so yeah, we we used to you know play in jazz band and um and then go and write some original rock covers and do some uh, rock rock um rock songs and do some covers of you know metallica rage against the machine chili peppers so so that was really fun and that was kind of like an outlet and we called ourselves e-day fix um nice. so just a play on the words of you know the billiards i-d-e i-d-e-e-f-i-x-e and we, yep. but we spelt it e-d-a-y-f-i-x <laughs> just to be rebellious as yeah. you know just do <laughs> 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 so so were you thinking you were going to go be a rock bassist or did you want to be a musician professionally at all at that point? I love how you came into bass like so many people. I was sitting around a, a bass festival a couple of years ago and everybody at the table, I said, how'd you get into, how'd you get into devil bass? Heavy metal, 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 yeah. punk rock, metal. It's like so many of us. Me too. My my band was Toxic Death, and then my mom mm. wouldn't let me quit orchestra, and I so I switched to mm-hmm. double bass, and now I don't even remember where my electric bass is. But um, <laughs> were were you thinking that you were going to do music, or maybe at what point did you get serious about that? Um, definitely at the end of high school. Yeah. Um, there was a point where I I felt that um, I I would something would be missing if I just did it as a hobby, you know, and I I had to at least try and see what, what, where it could take me, you know, if I were to really take it seriously. And, um, you know, at that point, um, I was thinking of doing classical bassoon. I was thinking of doing jazz on bass. And then, um, then also the possibility of, of just not doing music at all, doing law, but, um, but at that point, it was kind of clear to me that I, it, I needed to at least try it, you know, and um, it does, you know, looking back, it, it was a bit of a leap of faith in the sense that um, I went in to study jazz on electric bass without really, like, I, I fiddled, fiddled around on school double basses, but I had no idea how to play it. And um, and I really didn't know that much beyond, like, um, a couple of standards and a blues. And um, and so the first few years in, in at, at WAPA, the uh, conservatory was um, basically just spending a lot of time trying to learn how to play the music and learn how to play the instrument of the upright bass. And, um, but I'm kind of, I'm glad I did it because, you know, I, I think I felt that I really wanted to learn how to improvise and to learn the, the language of improvisation and, and jazz. And, you know, sometimes you just got to go for it and, and just have that faith that, you know, you're going to work hard and just try your best. Yeah. Have you been into jazz before WAPA or is WAPA? Is that how you pronounce it? Am I getting, yeah, okay, good, yeah. good. Okay. I'm learning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, had, were, were, were you into jazz or had you done any, any sort of improv on the piano or anything like that? Or mm. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as part of the, the Yamaha program that there, there were, um, sections that kind of didn't encourage us to compose and to improvise a little bit so so it wasn't completely new to us but the idea of of chord changes and vocabulary that sort of thing was quite new and it wasn't until sort of um getting into high school um when my older sister kind of introduced me to all sorts of amazing music and um everything from john zorn to miles davis to diggable planets to michelle and dega cello you know like um she had a really eclectic and diverse palette and I'm really grateful for that, you know, cause this is at a time when a lot of my friends were, were listening to Spice Girls or, you know, yeah. and not to discount what they're doing, but sure. <laughs> you know, it, it, it just, it was, especially for somewhere as remote as Perth and at a time when we don't have YouTube, we don't have Spotify or Apple music. And um, so I'm very lucky that that kind of influenced me and introduced me to a lot of cool listening. Can you imagine how much different it must be for people that age right now with I mean mm-hmm. discounting COVID obviously but like like the, the ability to literally you know with my Apple Music subscription or Spotify or YouTube you know look mm-hmm. up essentially anything like that I just it would be so interesting to go back in time and let let your past self know what that crazy power that 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 we have now exactly exactly I mean it's great that music is so accessible and that you can you know almost virtually get your hands on 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 anything but at the same time it's like yeah having that gratitude also for the the whole process and and not to mention even just the economical impacts of 
of streaming and all that accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I love the 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 it, what is it, the physical product that you released with your album okay, get that mm. and and how you unfolded into the trifold. That reminded me of I used to work at the music library at Northwestern back in college, and mm -hmm. and the entire it's this cool old building. The entire room is lined with old with jazz records. It's like nothing. Mm. It's this, this ridiculous collection. I would go in and I would say, let's. I'm going to go through Chet Baker. To, I'm going to go through every and and it was just so cool to pull out those LPs and go through and put them on. You know, and the, the CDs were becoming the norm, but we still had that great and and I, you know these days I'm. It's so rare that I hold something like in my hands. You know, and so it's so mm -hmm. cool to. But but what an experience that was, even with the CD uh, uh, packaging to open up, or even with tapes back in my Metallica days, pulling out mm -hmm. like and Justice for All and and holding that. So can you talk yeah. about that? And it's, it's super cool. The in, environmentally friendly packaging that mm. that you were using. Yeah. So um, my husband Fabian Almazan, um, uh, who plays piano, he started a label called Biophila Records, <laughs> and the idea is to have a music label, but that also supports environmental awareness. And we do volunteer work, um, cleanups, tree planting, that sort of thing around New York City, and. Um, we, we try and uh, connect with other like-minded musicians and um, uh, and try and stay active like musically but also just um, in in that scene and um, of, of talking about the environment and and what's happening in, throughout the world and I'm very proud of of what he's done because it, it's been um, such a passion of his and it's a lot of hard work I mean even just starting a label on its own but then adding all these other elements you know it's, it's a lot of work and dedication and basically he wanted an alternative to CDs but he didn't um, necessarily just want downloads yeah. you know and um, he's he's incredibly creative and you know, there was a time when I, I was, you know, he, he was busy with something and I was like, oh, what's he doing? And and he got in the mail like a prototype of this this really cool thing that folded out. And I was like, what is that? It's like, oh, just something I'm working on, you know. And and so he kind of designed this, um, um, I believe, uh, yeah, 20 panel um, FSC certified um, uh, paper art, essentially, um, with vegetable based inks. And um, it, it folds out and it looks like a, a CD cover, mm -hmm. you know, and you could, the, the design is so that you should be able to put it in a CD rack if you have one, you know. Um, but you, uh, there's no plastic in it. And that was kind of the, the MO behind it of not having any plastic, but you could still download the music in in even higher quality mm -hmm. than than the 44.1 sample rate that you would get on a CD. So when people complain about downloads, it's like, well, no, actually you can get this in 96K yeah. if you're a real audiophile and, and appreciate that and various formats. You could get an MP3 or FLAC if you want, um, and, but you get all the information there. And, and I think that's um, really, it's essential um, because, you know, I, I mean, I, can, I can't tell you the amount of times that um, that students have, have said, oh, I've checked out this record. I'm like, oh, who's on it? Or who? And they're like, oh, yeah. Oh, you know? Every day when I sit down to practice, I get out my phone and I boot up Modacity, which is my practicing companion. And I have a specific routine I go through. And here is Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelf on what he does each day with Modacity. What I do when I load Modacity every day is if I don't have a playlist constructed already, what I do is I go in and I think, oh, how long do I have to practice right now? Okay, I've got 40 minutes. Cool, I'm going to do five minutes on meditation, get my body state right. I'm going to do scales for five minutes and I'm going to visualize and I'm going to do this piece that I'm working on. You just set it up, see the budget and follow the budget effortlessly by delegating that to the phone. Letting my phone do all those logging details has been so great for my practicing. I can't recommend this app highly enough. Love it, love it, love it. Learn more at modacity.co. And we have a special offer if you go to our site for lifetime access to this app. It's so cool. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. That's such a good point. That's I, that's how I learned so many names of drummers and and piano mm -hmm. players and just like a, a ring, yeah, just sitting there and sort of staring at that. That's such a good point. You you, can, you it, a lot of it you can't even access, or if you can, it's incredibly hard uh, mm -hmm. digitally. What that's a that's mm -hmm. a great yeah, that's a great benefit to doing that. Yeah, and um, and especially for rhythm section or side side mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily band leaders and 
and you know back in the day it's like you know we think of sam jones and you know um ray brown and oscar peterson tree i mean both were composers and and you know ray was a significant leader um especially but um you know side people were very much valued and and i think they still are but it's a different thing now because uh, we don't have that information as easily available anymore with the streaming um so um you know and and you know there are these uh downbeat critics polls and and of who's who's the number one um you know instrumentalist in whatever category or, or vocalist um and it's you know, I I wish there was like a MVP category, you know, for 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 side person because you know in some ways it's like, um, you know, I think of Larry Grenadier and he's someone that I've I absolutely adore his playing and you know he only just recently, relatively recently, released his own stuff, you know, yeah. and and I wonder um, how that changes for for a lot of up and coming musicians of. Um, feeling the need to be a leader. I mean, I, I love being a leader as well. You know, there's different perks to it um, than being a side man, but a side person. But um, you know, just just to be appreciated as a side person. You know, I think that comes a little hand in hand with with some of the way that the music has been sold or or packaged. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's such an interesting topic. I. I, I um. And I, by the way, uh, I saw I got a chance to see Larry Glenn. Glenn oh my! I can't talk. Too, mm -hmm. <laughs> not enough coffee. Larry Grenadier. Uh, apologies, Larry. At SF Jazz here, he was mm -hmm. doing this tour for the Gleaners, and and it was so mm -hmm. cool. I don't, have you played SF Jazz? I'm assuming you have. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was in that little. Uh, I've seen a few bass players. They always end up in the small, the Joe Henderson lab with the yeah. windows, and you're seeing people go by. And I, I yeah. was talking to him after the show and just saying, you know, is this new for you? I wasn't sure. He was like laughing. He's like, yeah, it's totally bizarre to tour. But it was so cool mm. to, to think I'm at one of the major performing venues in a major city and I'm essentially mm. listening to a solo double bass recital. And mm. so, and, and I just, that struck me. It's like, how cool is that? There's the San Francisco Symphony over there, the opera there, solo double bass. But anyway, mm. um, the, the I was talking a few years ago to Miles Mosley about the whole sideman predicament, maybe you could call it, and just the challenges mm of trying to and you strike me as someone that's really um been able to have a have a career a, as a leader and then of course working with so many different artists as a side person and then as a composer and i and i just love this is kind of a terrible question because i'm all over the place but i i just love your to know your thoughts because i remember miles talking about being very intentional about uh writing for commercial music and then with the west coast hustle about them all kind of being each other's bands and their albums so they're mm -hmm building their own name kind of helping each other out like just do you have any any thoughts on w how you've navigated that how someone who's coming up might want to think about uh you know not being lost to history because we don't have uh lps with mm -hmm. their names listed <laughs> yeah you know i don't know i um i mean what i'd say first and foremost is, is follow 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 your what you want to do you mm -hmm. know it's like not everyone will want to be um the consummate side person necessarily you know and i think i think there's room if if you want to be a virtuoso um bassist that plays solo recitals go ahead you know um it just depends what you're after and um you know in my mind when i was starting out i just i wanted to become a stronger bass player I wanted to be be able to have that Ray Brown beat. I wanted to be able to to hold um, steady in a band in 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 almost any configuration and just hold it down, you know. Um, and um, that was kind of my my goal. I wanted to be strong and and um, and being a leader wasn't necessarily even so much on the cards in the beginning it mm -hmm. was just like how much can i learn i'm just going to play as much as i can go to various jam sessions learn as many tunes as i can and you know uh, be able to be that person that someone can call last minute and say hey i need you to do this and then you can just come in and just do it you know and and do the job well you know so um 
And that means playing a lot. It means playing with a lot of different drummers, mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, because I think, you know, bass players and drummers have a very strong connection. And, and also in terms of sound, um, you know, play with, during, throughout the COVID situation, like I've only just started playing with a drummer, a local drummer here, because there are zero COVID cases here. And it makes a big difference to your acoustic sound when you're, um, when you're kind of forced to have that presence, you know, with a drummer, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it kind of depends on, on what you want um, and that can evolve as well. Um, it's, I mean, it's really nice uh, to have the community, you know, um, you know, just relating to what Miles was saying about helping each other out. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that, um, that is important, you know, um, rather than just sitting in your practice room and just shedding all the time, having a community really helps of like-minded musicians and um, people who can stoke your creativity and help you out, you know, and build a band sound rather than just an individual sound, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, follow your bliss, you know, figure out what what makes you thrive and, and go for it and find out the steps that will lead to that, you know. It's it's hard with the industry and um and and I you know, I think if there's more education on, on um especially earlier education um about music in, in general in, in the general public so that people are more informed, you know. Sometimes it seems a bit disparate that it's, you know, these uh, musicians who know a lot and then, then the general public who, who may not, you know, and, and it would be just great if there was more, I guess, communication, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. um, in a bigger sense. Um, as the, uh, so that creative music and improvisation maybe isn't as foreign in, in some ways, you know. Do, um, do you find that there are some regions of the world that are that that are a little bit more knowledgeable than others? I found that certainly in the classical world, you know, it's a, it's it's mm -hmm. obvious examples are like going and playing Beethoven in Germany or something like that, or my, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, versus you know, back I lived in Chicago for a long time that have like what they call the Chicago standing ovation, where half of them are standing up to applaud the other half are grabbing their coats to get to the parking garage um but mm. uh, ha have you noticed like like in terms of cr uh, improvised music creative music or just like are, are, or maybe a better question is where are there areas of the world that you particularly like to like to play because of that reason mm. yeah i mean i i always enjoy playing in japan yeah you know, i feel like there's a lot of um a, a, a lot of knowledgeable listeners mm -hmm. and appreciative listeners yeah. in japan um and um you know, playing a lot in um, those settings, like um, you feel a lot more appreciated for sure when, when people aren't trying to talk over you. Um, I remember playing in Korea also and just how, what I absolutely loved and I, you know, I could be completely overgeneralizing, but um, my experience was that um, I was, I was playing Pat Metheny and, and it was like, after a solo, the crowd would, would go nuts, but then they'll be respectful for what was to happen after, and <laughs> and it was always like yeah, and then just jump, you know, and and I really appreciated that because I, I I do the same actually, like I you know if I hear a solo, I'm like yeah great great, but I I'm, I still want to yeah. hear what's going on after, you know, um, so yeah, there are <laughs> definitely places you know around the world. Um, and that, um, with with educated listeners and appreciative listeners, you know, um, you, you know, you'll get your places where, if it's especially instrumental music, if there's no lyrics or vocalists, you know, some people find it hard to even tune in, you know, and mm -hmm. and um, and that's just the way it is in, in some areas of the world, yeah. It's funny. I, th I think of Pat Metheny every single day for a very random reason, and and then I, and then mm -hmm. I think about you. Like after that, uh, because there's a car. I, th I think it's something that works in my condo building. Has a car, mm -hmm. and the license plate says Pat Metheny, <laughs> and then it's got a Grateful <laughs> Dead sticker in the back. So I'm thinking, all right. Um, that is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know. To totally random. Random aside. Mm -hmm. um, but you strike me as somebody who's both. You know what I've what I've read in terms of interviews with you or. or just other you, you you seem like such a humble person but then also just so dedicated to lifelong learning just my my, my interpretation um and I, I think maybe it was on one of those discover double bass videos you were talking about recently taking a lesson with ron carter and and mm -hmm. and there was a program i uh that that you've been 
that's that you've been or maybe is funding some study uh, with uh, with all kinds of big names, right? Can, what, can you just talk about like? I just love to know what somebody in your position. I mean, you're you've done so much. Like, how do you think of going and taking a lesson? I mean, any, anybody would love to take a lesson with Ron Carter. That makes sense. But just like, how do you think mm-hmm. about lifelong learning, or especially like going and and working with other people uh, from the position you're in? I, you know, if I could, I think I'd be one of those perpetual students that mm-hmm. just never graduates in many ways because I, 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 there's just so much to learn. There is, there is so much. And, um, and I, like, even at the moment, I, I was lucky enough to get uh, the Margaret Witten Award from the Jazz Gallery in New York City, which enables um, a, a female musician to study with, um, with a mentor, you know, and, um, and I, I'm studying, um, both with Maria Schneider, also in composition and just general life. And, um, she's just so amazing. Yeah. What what is she like? I, there's, there's a day like, I, like, I, I think the world of her, what, what the heck is it like getting to, Mm. getting to chat with her and uh, about music or whatever? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well at the moment we've just emailed, I'm yet to set it up. Um, just because, um, you know, when we were trying to set this up, the COVID thing, kind of happened and then yeah. I found out I was pregnant and then, you know, so, um, <laughs> sure. so yeah, we're, we're about to set that up. Um, but we've been emailing and I've been checking out a lot of her scores and, and her interviews and, and, um, she's, she's just, I mean, she's an incredible person. She's, she's incredibly humble, incredibly talented, um, and just super open and giving mm-hmm. person, you know, um, and I feel like that comes out in the music that she writes, but additionally, like she, you know, she's testified in Congress about music and, and the music industry and, mm-hmm. um, and the, un, the inequity, you know, when it comes to, uh, payment for musicians and compensation for musicians. And, um, you know, you'll notice that I think she only has like a, a small compilation on Spotify, but she doesn't use those streaming services. And she has um, such a self-made platform on Artishare where she sells all her scores and you can take a sneak peek on, you know, what the whole process was like. Like it's really, she's really fantastic and so proactive in that arena. It's it's super inspiring. Wow. Um um, and then I'm, I'm going to start lessons with, um, I think probably next year when COVID is, is done, but with uh, percussionist, Cuban percussionist Roman Diaz. Mm-hmm. So we have some bata drums that we brought over here that um, my husband and I are going to start practicing and then get some lessons with Roman. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's a, and, and didn't you earlier in life, didn't you, you were taking lessons with a, with a drum set player too, back a, in New York. Mm. Maybe, maybe I, what mm. I'd love to know, cause I, I also love playing for people who don't play bass. You know, it's so interesting mm. to get the perspective of a flute player or a, you know, violinist or, or, or bass trombone player or whatever. Like, are there, what, do you remember any, 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 Thing that stuck out at you that like what, what would a percussionist comment on that that mm. might be surprising to a bass player um well uh i what i'd say is that it's incredibly useful you know mm-hmm. for bass players to take lessons with drummers and drummers to take play uh, to play to take lessons with the bass players you know um i do think that that connection is really special and something very strong and um and i just think also being it part of the rhythm section too in general um you know it, it's it's quite an important um relationship you know mm-hmm. and when i was coming up i would play a lot duo with other drummers and we'd experiment with rhythm and time and playing on top of the beat behind and and just playing a lot duo you know um without any comping instruments or, or anything so um for bass players it's it's really strengthening and um i feel like a lot of my favorite bass players uh, could play drums or were drummers, you know, and I feel like, you know, it, it would help if if a lot of, if every musician had some sort of knowledge of percussion and, and drum set in particular, you know, just in terms of groove and time and rhythm. Yeah. Um, so from the perspective of, of having someone like John Riley, who's so studied, um, but also very connected, like he's, he's always listening to what younger musicians are up to and almost nothing like if I bring in something and I'm like oh hey John have you checked that out and he's like oh yeah of course you know that I could never really stump him you know with anything (laughs) that 
bring in it would be oh yeah i know that yeah have you checked out this record you know so someone who would really listen to a lot of music so um but but i think it is um something very useful um for for um people to do is study with someone that's not on your instrument and has another perspective on on what they like as well yeah. from a from from you know a bass player or, or whatever instrument you play mm. yeah no it's 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 yeah the uh, 100 percent. and that percussion thing is so interesting because I, I i didn't realize for a long time that brian bromberg got his start on drum set when he was really young mm, and yeah. and of course you can kind of think about it when you see the way he plays that kind of makes sense i was actually just mm. chatting with uh Tom, tomoya amori uh who's a bassist cellist and percussionist in new york and he's the mm. only person i've ever talked to that like plays jazz dates and and subs in the percussion section of the Met. So it's just so, <laughs> so I guess, I guess they're out there. Amazing. Um, yeah. Well, I would love, I would love to know, like, uh, and I think you talk about this a bit uh, for, for Jeff, for the Discover Double Ace videos, but, but like, how, how do you spend your time when you're doing music? Like, what does that look like for you? Are you, are you at the piano? Are you saying, all right, I'm composing now and I'm doing this or I'm, I'm going to practice, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Zimmerman Boeing book, which I know you've done in the mm -hmm. past. Like, like, mm -hmm. do you, do you, do you, or do you, are you spontaneous? Do, do you just get mm -hmm. up and start doing something? Like, I just love to know. I think it's so interesting how people organize their creative or their advancing their craft time. Mm, yeah, it definitely depends, and it's definitely a little different now. Um, sure. With, with <laughs> considering the circumstances, but um, usually it's I'm a, uh, you know, I have a rough kind of plan for sure before I start, you know, and um, you know before uh, you know all of this hit um, the COVID situation. Uh, I, I was still doing a lot of my own music, but other people's music as well. So it would just be a lot about budgeting my time with, with what needs to get done, you know, and um, that might mean um, blocking out a set, an hour or two for um, so-and-so's music if it's quite difficult and what, what can I do to, you know, just budget my time so I still have time for for other fundamental practice and maybe the fundamental practice kind of sits on the wayside a little bit until I have more time, you know, to come back to that. And, um, so it's kind of prioritizing, um, general work as well. You know, what needs to get done, what shows am I doing that week or, or things that are coming up and long, long time kind of things that I'm working on mm -hmm. slow burn things that I'll constantly be checking out, you know, um, and I am a bit regimented in the sense that um, it's not like I'm super strict by the minute of, of what I do, but um, time needs to be budgeted because yeah. it's not a lot of it, you know. Um, so and then then when it comes to writing music and um, having to arrange for deadlines or, or write music for deadlines, time has to be allotted for that as well, you know. Um, and I, I'll try and you know, even if something isn't completely perfect, at least if I've spent X amount of time on that and I know that I can do that the next day and the next day, I can at least see that, have faith that that's going to get there, you know, mm -hmm. um, not worry too much about it being perfect right now, you know. Well, a few of these pieces, I was reading through the liner notes uh, for for your latest album, and I think it, were some of those pieces I, I had been on the burner for like 13 years or something like that. A few of those yeah. things, right? So so yeah. how do you decide when something's done? If you've got, like, you could go another 10 years on it, maybe. like, And then also, yeah. I'd love to know, how is that, I, I how are those ideas stored? Are you putting things into Sibelius or Finale or Dorico or whatever? Are you recording things? Are you working in mm -hmm. a DAW and then you come back to it? Like, where... Where do you leave things that are in process? Yeah, um, it kind of depends. Um, well, firstly, with, with some of the songs that I kind of started um, a while ago, um, I feel like um, some of it started with me just trying stuff out. And then as I got better at arranging and, and, and um you know, with some of my decision making, things evolve, and then obviously getting getting things played by musicians, and especially improvising musicians, you start to realize, oh well, maybe I could do this, and and this could breathe a little bit more, you know. So, um, so that was kind of um, how some of those pieces evolved, and then also tastes change a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and you get to a point where you know what, I I'm not into this anymore. I need to x this out, and then just completely 
replace that with that and then that's going to evolve into something new you know Mm -hmm. so some of that kind of happened throughout the years um and and i i think that's a good thing you know like um uh sometimes we're so precious with you know when we put things down on paper or you know on Sibelius uh, that that is the way it is and you know when you when I think of composers like Wayne Shorter or something like all of his tunes like so much of his stuff has um, evolved you know yeah. and, and um, there's various versions of, of certain tunes with slightly different chord changes you know um, so uh, and 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 I, I like that idea of sometimes these these compositions having a, a breathing living men- mentality um but i feel like there is a point where you're kind of ready to kind of let it go though you know that there sure. are some things that they're just not ready yet you know um yeah so um and the second part of that question I'm sorry. oh no i was just curious all like i i just mm-hmm. love hearing how people structure things out like that and and mm-hmm. and, and and yeah how because i like like so many people i have projects in various states and i come back and then i give up mm-hmm. and then i it gets out in the world and it's just it's just it's just interesting to me how mm-hmm. how that evolved. what um if we remember back to the days when we used to travel <laughs> eight mm-hmm. months ago before like it, it, you were on the road a pretty decent percentage of the time right mm-hmm. like like what was your travels maybe the last four or five years were you on the road more than at home or what what did that look like for you mm. um yeah i i was away a lot um mm-hmm. uh you know i want to say maybe maybe half of the year or so okay. roughly you know okay um yeah maybe a little less um and uh um you know, things are a little bit um, different now that I'm teaching at Berkeley, mm-hmm. um, and I'm lucky to be able to do it online right now um, from Perth. Uh, but yeah, it was it was getting pretty tiring, especially um, and because I commute to Berkeley as well from New York City. So um, wow. you know, in some ways, like when when the COVID shutdown happened, it was just nice to have a meal with my husband and just sit and be able to yeah. have a night to to have a meal and talk, you know, rather than just over FaceTime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's mm-hmm. a substantial, and especially with that com- commuting like that uh, to mm-hmm. to Berkeley. Yeah, that's a that's a serious amount of time. How uh, when that that sounds like an incredibly busy schedule like how how do you keep growing or composing or doing all that when you're on the road because i i just know it's like mm-hmm. there's just chaos and there even when it's a set up well mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, do you work on planes do you work in hotel mm-hmm. rooms do you just things don't really move forward that much on the road or how how, how did that or does that mm-hmm. when that happens again how does that look for you yeah, completely. Hotel rooms, planes, okay. trains. Yeah. And um, yeah, very lucky to, you know, even to have a laptop and, you know, to be able to do that stuff on the road. Um, yeah, that that's where a lot of things happen, actually, you know, and um, I use primarily Sibelius when I write or if I come up with something, I might sing it into my voice memos and mm-hmm. then plug it into Sibelius oh, cool. after. Yeah. Um, um, I do I do use Pro Tools and Logic every now and again for certain things, but rarely is it kind of does it start from a, a DAW and then onto um, paper. So um, yeah, so so yeah, it, it's pretty much just it, you know finding the time when you you can have that um, um, space to to write or create, and and some of it is necessity. You know, having deadlines can be a really good thing. You know, <laughs> right. you just have to do it. You know. <laughs> Um, and you know, in some ways the, the, like the commute to Berkeley, like, um, Amtrak, I can sit there with Wi-Fi and, yeah. and just, you know, you yeah. Know. No, I actually that like we were talking earlier about planes that train time I actually don't really mind Amtrak I, when I was out in New York taking the I was headed I headed out to Diderio a couple years ago mm-hmm. and taking the Long Island whatever that train is that goes out there you know mm-hmm. I love breaking out the laptop or the iPad or whatever and using that time and it's it's mm-hmm. uh, it's pretty great how, how um how is the time difference for Berkeley uh Perth to Berkeley uh, mm-hmm. just logistically speaking i was kind of curious what are you teaching at 1 a.m yeah. or does is is your evening that like what are you doing in terms mm-hmm. of making that work 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm for the most part, I'm, I'm starting around 8 or 9 p.m. Okay. I might go as late as 2 a.m. Um, and there are some European students, so I might start at around 5 p.m. Okay. So, wow. Yeah, it's generally, um, you know, late afternoon up to evening and early hours of the morning. Um, but luckily, I'm spreading it out throughout the day, so it's not like packing it all in. Yeah. Had, had, had you done a lot of online teaching before this pandemic broke out or cause, cause I know you've done mm. in-person teaching obviously, but I'm just curious, yeah. had you been doing a lot of like Skype lessons or the like over the years? Um, just a handful, okay. you know, not, not a whole ton, but uh, just a handful. Um, so it was a bit of an adjustment, but, um, you know, obviously it's not, uh, I love playing with students, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, um, you can get so much of a, a good sense of, of where someone's at when you're playing with them and you get a mm -hmm. sense of their time feel, what it feels like to play with them. And that, that's a shame to not be able to do that so easily, you know, unless we have Jack trip or something. Yeah. And super. I, I was wondering, internet, I was know. actually just going to ask, cause I just did a couple interviews about Jack trip uh, with, mm. with uh, some of the people that are involved in the development. And, but the problem is mm -hmm. unless you're uh, geographically close, it still doesn't quite work. And there we have the problem of Perth, yeah. like <laughs> even mm. the, the next major Australian city, you'd probably have enough lag. You're certainly not going to be playing fast bop tunes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, the the proximity for sure, and and even the what I've heard is the internet provider actually. Mm -hmm. If you're on the same internet provider, that makes a difference as okay. well. So, yeah, so it's yeah, we're definitely not able to do Jack Trip from the states to here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Are are um are there any? Obviously, there are a whole bunch of negatives to teaching online and mm -hmm. not being able to teach in person. Have you discovered mm -hmm. any positives? Uh, I I. I I don't do much teaching, but I've seen, I've seen even the little I do, I've seen, oh, there are some things that are actually pretty cool about connecting like this. Mm. Yeah, I, I think there are positives, you know. Um, I, I just finished teaching um, some summer programs at Berkeley and, you know, some, some of the uh, students were saying how great it is, like they... They've always wanted to do those programs, but they could never make it over there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we had one person who was a, a nurse in... Um, in California who was an ER nurse and he, he was working the ER night shifts and then he would come and do this program, you know, once a week, which he wouldn't have been able to do had it been in person, you know, and then we had someone else from Hungary who wouldn't have been able to travel. And, um, uh, and we've also had some really fantastic guest speakers, guest artists who wouldn't have normally been able to travel um, to the school, you know, yeah. um, um, as part of, I, I teach with Cheryl Lynn Carrington in her department, and she she brought um, the wonderful Angela Davis, uh, Wayne Shorter, you know, people yeah. who, um, who are quite busy, you know, too busy to travel um, over, you know, in many ways. So uh, it's, it's fantastic in, in those, regards you know you yeah. can have access to a lot of um information remotely yeah and then also just um having the students record themselves and actually listen back mm -hmm. you know um i feel like we didn't do as much of that in person as they they're doing now and now they're like oh wow okay i do need to work on my time or i do need to work on my intonation you know when they're forced to kind of listen back and watch you know yeah yeah no that's a huge benefit uh for for sure just having that record button right there and then and yeah, yeah it's there that's that's a huge one yeah. When I'm such a fan of yours, I, it's so fun to to get to to get to chat with you. I'll mm -hmm. I'll link up to obviously your website. I can I'll look up to Berkeley. The uh, Biophilia has you launched a subscription service too, I believe, right? A few yeah. days ago. Okay, so um, yeah. that that maybe maybe could you maybe briefly share what what's involved with that? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure of the exact pricing, but yeah, you can sign up to subscribe or you get basically all of the content, all of the Biophilic catalog, um, and you get updates on what we're doing. Um, we've also started a blog series called Impacts, and it's um, catered towards um, not necessarily professional writers, but people who are kind of on the front lines of, um, um, if, of, of kind of um, environmental... Um, raising awareness about environmental issues, um, particularly sacrifice zones, you know, areas that have been affected um, not intentionally necessarily by um, um, 
uh, by climate change or, or pollution or, or some sort of environmental damage and um, they're commissioning writers to write blogs um, for that so if you're one of those people who who blogs about a certain you know issue environmental issue um, you know contact us you know we'd love to feature more up-and-coming people you know so we have someone uh, Peter Litunde from um, uh, Karugachu in Kenya who well, who wrote about one of the biggest dump sites um, in the world, um, which is affecting his community. And, you know, so, um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of digressing, but yes, yeah, you can subscribe and you can also um, read all this fabulous content and just get connected with us. And um, hopefully when we start volunteering again, and, you know, it can come join us and plant some trees and yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Linda, thank you so much. That was a fun one. I had such a great time. And with artists that are on the more prominent side, like Linda, you know, in our world, speaking about that, and next podcast guest also, uh, it's really fun to go deep down the rabbit hole of everything they've done. I've got just reams of notes, listening to everything she's done, everything I can find, reading, reading articles about her. And I just, I had such a great time. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about doing this podcast. Uh, the side benefit for me is it's an invitation. I, I'm, this is my latest phrase, an invitation to more fully explore that artist's universe. And I learned so much in the process. I've said this endlessly on the podcast, if you're a regular, but it's a great it's personal development tool for me, frankly. I never thought of it that way. I, I don't know what I thought of it back in 2007 when I started, but that's the way I've been thinking of it more recently, certainly since I resurrected it from the dead back in 2015. And it's just such an honor and a privilege. I don't know how the heck I ended up doing this, uh, but it is definitely developing my my curious mind. And it's, it's something that really brings me a lot of fulfillment. So thank you for listening. If you're new, hey, maybe you're new. Uh, welcome. We've got a vast archive for you to explore over at ContraBasedConversations.com. You can download our app if you like. Well, of course, all this is if you like, but if that, many find that an easier way to browse, especially if you're looking for specific topics, it's really quick in terms of the built-in search engine and it's iOS, Android, Kindle. So you can check that out at ContraBasedConversations.com. I can't speak, .com slash app. We also have a weekly email newsletter that has grown in popularity, uh, kind of surprisingly to me, although I don't know, I I think it's good. So maybe not surprisingly uh, that comes out every week on Friday and we have base news of, of all of, from all around the world. It's something I've been doing in various formats for years. It used to be on the blog. I used to do it in video form and it's kind of evolved into this newsletter. And then on Tuesdays, we share out something real quick, just one thing. And I'm just so happy the way that's evolved. So you can get on the list, just visit ContraBaseConversations.com or ContraBaseConversations dot com slash email or you'll probably find some sort of form or pop-up going there anyway and finally if you'd like to reach out to me and say hi or suggest a guest or a theme or anything like that i keep track of all that and i love hearing from people feedback at contrabaseconversations.com is the email address for that contrabase conversations is produced by michael cooper steve hinchy mitch mooring trevor jones and krista copper the theme music is by eric hockberg and mitch makes beautiful bases in the dallas fort worth area kilgore texas just east of dallas fort worth learn more at mitchmooring.com i'm your host jason heath and we will see See you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.